And uh, for this, let me introduce um, our panelists. And uh, the first one, who I would also then like to, uh, to invite to come to the stage, um, is Sibylle Gabler. Sibylle is member of the Management Board, External Relation Divisions, uh, Division of Dean. Sibylle, give her a big applause. <laughs> so, Sibylle, thank you for being here, um, and thank you for also supporting this conference the second time in a row. Um, pleasure. What does sustainability mean to you? Well, obviously, I'm always going to talk about the solutions that come from standards. And, um, well, uh, I will give a few examples when we, when we start the discussion, um, how standards can um, facilitate sustainability. Mm -hmm. So it is a big topic for Dean. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let us, uh, please take a seat wherever you want to sit. <laughs> the next one who I would love to, uh, to invite to come up here is uh, Christina Gomlich. She is Head of Berlin Office Corporate Government Relations of BASF, also one of our supporting partners, and we have known each other also for a long time since um, our work um, at BDI. So thank you so much for joining us and give her also a big applause. So no, 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 don't sit. No, 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 no. The spiel, the spiel is first a question, then ah, sitting. Oh, ah, okay. So you have to. <laughs> Very sorry. So, ah. so the same to you. Um, what does sustainability mean to you? Well, I obviously also have to speak for my, um, for my company um, um, and for BSF. Um, it's our purpose. Um, so we create chemistry for a sustainable future. And um, it's basically um, the nucleus of the business that we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. The next one who I would like to ask to come and join me, where is she, um, is Natalie um, Martin Hübner. Where, there she comes. Give her a big applause. <laughs> She is uh, Head of Government Affairs at uh, Robert Bosch, so you are responsible for the representation here in Berlin, but also for all of Europe and the international affairs of Bosch and government relations. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you have quite a portfolio. Yeah. Uh, oh, not only on, uh, in the products, but also uh, with the topics uh, which come along with products and the services we and uh, we have. And sustainability comes in how in your daily work? Um, I think it's one of the greatest challenges we have at the moment. Uh, but I think as well that there is a bunch of engineers in our company that want to make the world better. And that's why I'm very confident that we have got something to offer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and let's hear a little bit more about this, uh, this later. So I would also like to ask uh, Hubertus Petto, um, president um, of the German Agriculture Society. So please uh, join us also here on the stage. <laughs> And now you might ask, or our audience might ask, why did we um, in, uh, invite somebody from the agricultural sector? Um, and um, for you, it is pretty obvious how much sustainability is involved, but maybe you can also tell our audience. Yes, that's easy because <laughs> I'm not only the president of DLG, but I'm also a farmer on myself. And I have children, and uh, obviously I want to do everything I can that my children can do the same job as I do, uh, successful in the future for a long time and help creating food for people. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. May I ask you a cheeky question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Were you um, one of those in the big tractors on the streets of Berlin? No, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. That, that's not GLG style. Yeah. We okay. Are a scientific organization, yes. Mm. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for yes. joining us. Um, and last but not least, um, I also would like to, where is he, invite uh, Loyal Kempel to come up here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> also, give him a big applause. You are a research fellow um, at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Yes. Um, we had already quite a few um, fellows from the uh, DGRP, mm -hmm. which isn't surprising because it's one of Germany's uh, biggest and oldest foreign policy think tanks. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, what, is the, what are you currently writing on? Um, th yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be participating here. I'm currently working on... Um, Geoeconomic policy, uh, specifically focusing on electric vehicles and what that might mean, and uh, Germany and Europe's role in multilateral initiatives uh, covering re renewable energies. 
So sustainability has something to do with geopolitics and Absolutely. economics? Absolutely. Okay, I think we want to learn a little bit more about this. Um, but first, also the question to you. Sustainability means what to you? Um, sustainability, uh, for me, it means something that's socially, environmentally uh, sustainable. So there's the, for me, I have very emphasized the social, the social part. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So if you want to join us as well. Um, and why I ask all of you to say something about sustainability in the beginning is uh, to set the stage, but also to say what we are talking about when we talk about sustainability. And maybe we can get a little bit more deep uh, into this, um, because some might think sustainability is all around environmental issues. Right? Um, some might say it's all about labor and social issues. Um, and some might say it is mostly about economic issues. But I guess it's listening to you. It's all three of this. Um, so um, maybe I can start out um, with a question uh, to you, Natalie, to get a little bit more deeply into, into the issue of all three aspects um, of sustainability. Um, I started my introductory words by painting a pretty grim picture about the world and all the, all the crises we are currently um, facing. Um, what does this mean for, for the business, for the actual business practices? So how do you maneuver in this, in this field? Yes, I think I already mentioned it. I, uh, we are a company of 420,000 associates uh, who really strive for making the world better uh, with the products and the services we offer, uh, with a large research and uh, development department. So I think um, there is really much we can have and make, and I think innovation is really key um, to make this world or to, to bring in sustainable uh, technologies which help uh, to give the entire population of the world the possibility to contribute, uh, to make more energy efficient uh, cooking or uh, to have electri electrified uh, vehicles or um, to be um, sustainably digitized, to have a more efficient um, autonomous driving or automated uh, manufacturing and so on. So I think, as I said, we have a very large portfolio and many services to offer. So that's one side of, of the coin. Um, on the other side, or oh, well, on the same side of the coin, we have a policy that gives the trend and gives incentives and pushes industry into a direction uh, which is necessary because uh, if civil society doesn't change uh, the, the mindset, uh, nobody would be interested in the products we offer. So I think regulation is again key to bring the framework where in which the products are uh, uh, fine consumers, and I think that's uh, very important. But one of the main challenges at the moment we uh, see is that regulation is somehow conflicting. It's not harmonized, it's not standardized, and uh, we have got the problem that we act in a global environment, and in this global environment we have a very, very fragmented um, framework, and uh, it's really difficult to see how to get through uh, the regulatory uh, situation and um, competitive systems instead of cooperative systems, mm -hmm. and uh, that's my last sentence. I think if we really want to resolve uh, the climate change problem, then we should uh, standardize and cooperate instead of being too competitive. Mm -hmm. And Natalie, you and your company um, are um, very active on both sides of the Atlantic, so you do have uh, different mm -hmm. standard sets. Um, and looking at climate change or climate protection policies, they differ a little bit. <laughs> so yeah. we are now, in, um, we in the EU have um, the border adjustment mechanism mm -hmm. um, being in the implementation phase. Um, in the US, you have more the investment side. Um, is that an issue for Bosch? Yes. Uh, it is an issue uh, because we have to adapt to the different systems. So on both uh, sides of the Atlantic, we have a different system. 
but I think we welcome very much the Inflation Reduction Act because we have we see many opportunities and I think the system is really um, it brings a large bunch of incentives so uh, you uh, address on the same side the uh, consumers with tax um, incentives and with investment incentives at the same time and uh, that's why we have been in discussions with the um, American government as well on some investments we made as a company. So I think we we are able to um, take both offers and we see in the European Union as well that we need to, um, to, to, to stay on eye level, we need those carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms because if not, you have a um, very unfair competition and you risk uh, the single market situation. Mm. So I think that's... Mm. But we are very agile, so <laughs> we deal with it. But I, I think we would be very happy if, if it would be more harmonized instead mm. of being fragmented. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And we will come back to the to climate policies um, in a second. Um, what I didn't ask all my panelists before we started. Um, at Aspen, we go by first name very quickly. May I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, so, looking at transatlantic climate and uh, especially energy uh, topics, we see some divergence there as well. Right. Um, so what does this, um, from your point of view and what you're working, working on, maybe you can tell us a little bit where we come closer hmm. together and where we are diverging a little bit more and what, if that is a problem or if maybe it's also good to have a little bit of competition. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think, uh, thank you very much for your question. I, I think the, the interesting thing is with having a divergence in paths is one can learn from one another. So. Um, the, 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 the real magic of the US IRA is that it's actually quite simple. Tax incentives and you know, uh, rebates, it's, it's really not as complicated as something that would come out of Brussels. Brussels and the European Union in general and all of the European member states have spent a large amount of money supporting um, green industry and supporting renewable energies, but a lot of it, getting access to that money is a lot more complicated. And regulations and qualifications, I mean, if you just look at the whole entire negotiation around the color of hydrogen and all of these things, it's the criterias are much more complicated than you have within the United States. And this is because energy is a, is an, is a national competence. You have divergence between the position on nuclear energy, between you know, say France and Germany, it's mm -hmm. quite stark. The position previously on Russian gas, again, quite stark. So the difference in energy policy, it really, really complicates the European decision in, the, in, this, in this space, whereas the United States is a little bit more flexible and a little more agile because there is there is definitely discrepancies in, with, with, between the Democrat and Republican camp, but you end you end up generally with this consensus to support most types of energy, and there's there's less discrimin there's it's not there's discrimination, but there's more uh, acceptance of multiple energy types, which is which is helpful because it simplifies the process. But there are lots of other spaces where there is room to learn from one another. Because I mean, a good example is the supply chain due diligence, kind of going through with uh, the solar things. Examples like the solar stewardship initiative being supported by Solar Power Europe to try and bring environmental and social considerations into the supply chain, especially for um, in this case solar panels and solar panel components, so that Europe uh, or countries like Europe or the United States kind of get. Um, credit for think, credit for the investments they make in socially and environmentally mindful product, produced goods. Whereas you know China, for example, doesn't really usually have a very good human rights track record or a very good environmental footprint with a lot of their manufacturing. So in this case, you can see different approaches to improve the supply chain and kind of. It's not that it per is pursuing a competitive advantage, but you're internalizing um, conditions that your companies are, that are operating within Europe already observe. You know, a company in Sweden already observes better social practices than a company in China. A company in Sweden powered mostly by hydropower is probably already observing um, you know, more investments in clean energy than you would be in, uh, in, within China. So you're kind of bringing that cost within to the, within to the scope of manufacturing. Um, but within the, within the scope of electric vehicles, you do have this kind of uh, convergence of points between de-risking and decoupling. 
and what that might look like and what does that look like in green supply chain, what that looks like in different technologies or different elements of the green supply chain. Uh, the, the interesting word of de-risking is this began in within the European space and this is normally within uh, foreign policy, you have a lot of big ideas and big terms and concepts coming from Washington and then coming to Europe from Washington. But in this case, you have a very interesting where it goes in the opposite direction where de-risking was really a European Thing, and that kind of moved back, moved over towards the Atlantic. And now you hear that rhetoric coming a bit more out of the, the US administration. Um, but what does de-risking look like within the space? It's very hard to find, especially within the energy policy, um, to completely move investment uh, from energy, new energy products um, from China. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a clear-cut picture. Uh, because you can cooperate with Chinese companies outside of China. There is there's a lot of opportunity for this. You can have Chinese companies that are producing world-class batteries like BYD or CATL uh, co make a joint venture and co-produce batteries within Germany or co-produce mm -hmm. batteries within the European Union. But the issue with the United States has a different approach. We have the foreign entity of concern uh, identified within the IRA, or is it either within the IRA or the Build Back Better legislation. But it's 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 still one of those one of those pe one of those caveats that makes it a lot more complicated to have a component that could be potentially mm -hmm. sourced from China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's 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 both. I, actually, mm -hmm. I think it's actually also on the Chips mm -hmm. Act. Yeah. Um, okay. So, but we come back to to uh, the issue of uh, resilient mm -hmm. uh, supply chains a little bit later and okay. de-risking um, and decoupling. Okay. Um, and um, since you mentioned um, energy quite a bit from different points of view, um, I think it would be really good to hand over now to Christina, because you need <laughs> energy for production um, and you need uh, gas as an input as well. Um, so your company was hit pretty hard. Um, uh, by the by, by sanctions on Russia, but also um, decoupling strategies um, or de-risking strategies. But at the same time, um, you also have to massively deal with the green transition and uh, regulations coming out of uh, Brussels. So, um, and and your your company has also faced some criticism, <laughs> but it is certainly also one um, a strong pillar of the German economy really strong pillar, an important pillar. So how do you maneuver that environment? What is, your, what, what is the company's strategy <laughs> <laughs> to deal with all those challenges at the same time? <laughs> um, basically, stiff upper lip and just, just stiff <laughs> upper go lip. through it, um, um, to be honest. No, um, I mean, we, we obviously, yes, we're challenged, um, obviously. I mean, um, we're, we're um, a German-based company, um, but a global player, so um, obviously so, so we have um, lots of production in all regions of the world. Because for us, I, mean, that, I think that's the key to how we manage this, um, we're there where our customers are. So um, our customer base, um, insofar as it's European, um, we're in Europe. Um, for the US, we're in the US. In Asia, we're in Asia. Or in China, we're in China. And um, that is, um, and, and um, I think part of the challenge that we're seeing is um, that apart from, 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 from the very real changes in um, challenges to our competitiveness that we experience here in Europe um, due to the extremely um, yeah the shift in energy prices um, due to um, due to the to Russia's war on Ukraine um, but we also see um, a shift in the balance um, of markets and um, the largest chemical market um, is China and um, and and will be China it will be huge it will be 50 percent of the world market in a couple of years and um, if you're not there, um, as you say, if, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So the question um, is not um, if, <laughs> are we in China? The question is, are we enough in China? And, um, and the question is, um, is, is simply due to the fact that if we're not there, others will do the business there. Others will get the market share and they will grow and they will not stay in China. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, so unless you really um, ramp up the walls, um, um, to Europe, um, which will not work, protectionism doesn't work, um, then we will face an enormous um, competition from Asia, from China, from the US, um, which are also not sleeping. In fact, they're very um, much um, well, catching up um, when it comes to um, competitiveness of green products. And um, yeah, and in Europe, we'll lose out. So um, what we do is um, we adapt. 
we have to, and um, we adapt, um, first of all, by adapting our operations, um, but we also, of course, adapt um, by advocating for better, um, um, b better, better framework conditions um, here in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where overregulation comes in, and um, I mean, and actually where, where, where the question is, um, is of the business case comes in. And I think that's um, at the center also of um, how to really transform, tra transform our, our industry or even the economy towards sustainability, it's we need a business case. Sustainability needs to be a business case. And um, at the moment, um, it's difficult. Um, because in order to be, to, to at least to be carbon neutral, and that's one of our goals, I mean, we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, um, and um, we want to reduce um, 25% of our um, CO2 um, emissions um, by 2030. Yeah, by 25% by 2030 compared to 2018. So, but in order to do that, we have to electrify. Electrification means, um, yeah, means renewables, means extremely high cost, um, and not only production costs, but also um, the, the, the whole network costs um, that are now um, added onto this. And um, at the moment, we still don't have consumers that really, that, that really pay for this. Mm. Um, and um, you can try again to adapt by pulling up walls around Europe and with a CBAM, which will not work. It will simply not work. It will have huge bureaucracy and the system will not work. Um, or you can try to, um, yeah, um, or, or you can try to do this by somehow creating a level playing field. And I think that's where um, mm. Transatlantic comes in. Mm. Okay, so you posed two questions to the whole panel, which we need to answer. Um, how uh, can we turn sustainability for the business sector into a business case um, so that it is worth investing, um, so that it comes naturally? Um, and the second question um, to all of our panelists we need to answer here is how we do it in a competitive way. Um, and how we stay competitive um, in the international markets. So I will not let you go from this panel before we answer all those two questions or have, have good answers to this. Um, now I would like to, to look um, at a sector which is very close to all of us because we eat every day. <laughs> and um, the agricultural sector. Um, but, and, and so everybody has an opinion on it. Right, um, and you told us that you are um, both on the policy side, um, you're on the association side, but you're also a farmer. Um, the sector has huge implications for sustainability. Um, if not managed well, um, it can have a not so sustainable impact. Um, if it is managed well, it could have a huge impact um, for climate change, but also for social sustainability. So. Tell us a little bit about the challenges, but also the solutions. Yes, I try. Um, I think uh, uh, the, the most important challenge you haven't mentioned, uh, because when we look at climate change, agricultural sector, food production, has the uh, uh, biggest challenge in adoption to climate change, because climate change will happen. We can do what we want. It will increase. The world's uh, temperature will increase by at least two degrees, and that's a big challenge for food production around the world. Uh, and that's my first point. And um, you have uh, asked a question in the, in the briefing, um, what can we learn from agriculture? I, I'm not really sure whether agriculture is quite ahead when it comes to sustainability, um, yes, uh, increasing sustainability of the production. And um, there are a few reasons for that, and these reasons will show us um, the direction to the solution. Um, what we need uh, as, um, when we try to manage the um, sustainability of agricultural production better is uh, indicators. Mm -hmm. That's uh, not really a sexy thing, indicators. It has to do with science. You have to, to collect data and you have to write down the things you do. But it's really important because what I cannot measure, I cannot manage. That's an old, old um, truth. And uh, these indicators, they have to be uh, outcome-oriented. That is one thing that is really important, but because at the moment we look at indicators when it comes to agricultural production that are input-oriented. We look at what amount of fertilizer we put into the system. But what is really interesting when it comes to sustainability is what is the impact on nature, on ecology, on, on social, of, of these uh, things we do. And so we have to try to evolve um, um, 
to develop indicators that are more outcome or impact oriented. And we have to standardize these indicators <laughs> around the world because farming is a global business. And when you, and that's the second thing, when you try to use these indicators to put a price tag, a sustainability price tag on the product, then you have to make sure that this price tag is the same around the world. Because when we uh, just say, okay, I have this German um, corn and this ha it has this sustainability footprint and I have this US corn and it has also a footprint but it is based on different indicators, then we have no level playing field and then we will uh, not uh, in evolve um, sustainability in a competitive way because we need competition. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the last topic. We need the markets to, to um, make sure that the allocation of, of uh, sustainability efforts is best. And uh, we always in Germany talk about sustainability politics and that we can try to, to solve our sustainability challenges by Ordnungsrecht. That won't work. Uh, when mm -hmm. sustainability uh, becomes a business model for the, for the, for the um, companies and for the farmers, of course, then, um, then it uh, will uh, begin to be successful. And one, one um, example for this is organic farming. Uh, we all know organic farming has its own challenges, but organic farming is, is a, a system puts a sustainability price tag on the product and the consumers, uh, they pay this price tag for the more sustainable quality of the products. And that's a, a thing that we can think about uh, also when it comes to, to different products. It, is it possible to, to uh, create a, a, a label for a product that uh, clearly uh, shows the sustainability impact of mm. this product? And is it possible to, to convince the consumers to pay the price for the production of this sustainable price? Mm -hmm. And that's the main challenge. And, uh, and we have to do this globally. It's not enough to do this in the, in the EU. We, we cannot um, yes, put a wall around Europe and, and say, OK, we are all fine with sustainability because we have to do global trade um, uh, even in food systems. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for also sharing um, already a couple of ideas. Um, the price tech for sustainability, which the consumers um, in a transparent way um, then also pay for, which would create a business case um, to go more into sustainability. You also um, told us about standards and standardization, which is an important issue. Um, and I can tell you, um, you, you, you know this, um, but our audience uh, doesn't, not all of them at least, do know this. We do have a transatlantic farmers program where we bring together eight farmers from the US and eight farmers from Germany um, to spend the year together virtually and physically to work on a specific topic. And last year we looked at climate change um, and they did talk a lot about standards, not so much actually about sanitary and future sanitary standards. So if something is... Um, well, we don't need to get into this, but um, so everything around um, uh, f food or GMOs or hormone-treated beef. Um, what they really wanted to talk about was standards and measurements, how you measure, for example, CO2 content in the soil and CO2 binding capacity of the soil and how to create certificates and then how to trade them and how to make also money from this. So I found that very interesting. So thank you so much for bringing this in. And it's also the perfect lead over um, to Sibylle because um, you, well, we, we all know standard setting is your business. <laughs> you do it uh, trend within the EU. Um, you do it transatlantically, you do it internationally. Um, and you do it for many different sectors, also the agricultural sector, the smart uh, farming initiative, for example. Um, we also heard um, from Loyal about uh, China, um, and China is a player becoming more and more important standard setting. Um, so tell us a little bit about how much you can really influence sustainability with standards. 
Well, let me maybe take up the yes, smart, smart farming first, because that's uh, it's actually a very nice um, example for how uh, transatlantic cooperation does work very nicely. We do have some example in standardization where it's, it's not working so nicely, but here um, an initiative goes actually back to um, a common conference Dean has with uh, our um, American colleagues, and um, we have that's a few years ago, where we have identified smart farming as an upcoming important topic. And at this stage, a few years later, we have um, a strategic advisory group at, at ISO, the International Standardization Organization, um, 40 different um, member organizations, so national standards bodies participating in that. They have come up with a recommendations paper, and there is a, a technical committee in ISO level working on data-driven uh, agriculture. I think that's the, the official term. So this, this all relates to, to, to what you're saying. I hope they work on indicators. I'm, I'm <laughs> quite sure they are. Um, but that's really good news that we come together right on international uh, level, and I think we're also closely connected to, to the mm -hmm. uh, initiative you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, to your, to your, actually, I, I might also take up the question you, that you raised because it's uh, probably a good, good way to, to raise a little bit uh, understanding of what standards can, can do for you. Standards um, or sustainability as a, as a business case because one of my favorite stories from uh, past months is um, this, this guy who's um, a startup, uh, uh, you know, has, has a startup and he's trading uh, plastic recyclers, so recycled materials. Mm. And of course here, having a startup and having, you know, coming into um, an area where there's still quite some insecurity, trust is, is very important. And um, here, um, standards can play a really uh, a positive role, and um, this guy has initiated a, a standard uh, or a specification under the roof of Dean. Uh, we have created a consortia, and um, they have come up with a standard. I have to have to read this: um, classification of recycled plastics based on data quality levels for use in digital trading. So that's a very basic um, standard of how to. Um, yeah, put a quality level on, on pl plastic uh, materials. And, and with this, he was able to actually go out there and, and uh, create trust and start his, his business. And um, now, this standard will be used in, in Europe um, as part of how to roll out the uh, plastics strategy, the European plastic strategy. So this is an ideal example how you know, a bottom-up approach, a business-driven approach, can also, you know, have some impact uh, in, in European policy and, and, and strategy. Um, so that's, that's very particular uh, um, uh, examples. Um, to your broader question, um, I mean, obviously, as, as we already said, uh, coming from Dean, I speak for the um, system that um, includes the European standardization organizations and, and ISO and IC on international level. And um, ISA particular, and I think IC has done the same, has taken a look at um, the, their body of standards. I mean, we're talking more than 20,000 technical uh, specifications and standards, and actually made a mapping um, uh, with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so that, there's a, there's a Registry, you can you can look at look it up online. Um, which standard actually helps fulfill which goal? And just to give one example for SDG 13, um, mitigating climate change, combating climate change, um, they found uh, I think was it um, 1,095 standards that help uh, uh, mitig uh, fighting climate change. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people think, you know, standards are very much about, you know, uh, details, technical details. That is true for the individual standard. But when it comes to standardization as a whole, uh, or the, the, you know, the body of standards, they're, they're really a powerful tool to help us uh, uh, for in, the, in our quest for sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and just a follow-up question to you. I mean... Standards are not set by one country alone, um, right? Um, 
they are also set on the international level. But I know that you have been in Washington also quite a bit, um, talking to your counterparts on the other side of the um, Atlantic. How well is standard setting for sustainability work internationally? I mean, is China signing up? Is India signing up? China and India are signing up. I mean, the, the, the standards uh, system is, um, is a bit complicated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Natalie is laughing, so we are handing over to her in a second. Let me, I mean, if you look at it transatlantically first, um, uh, let me try to put it in, 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 in fast words. I mean, in, in Germany, we have DIN and German stakeholders, German industry believes in the primacy of international standards. So they believe international standards should come first, then European standards, then national standards. And that's how we work. We also facilitate work and, and international standardization, where we meet China, India, uh, all kinds of other nations, including, of course, the U US. So uh, standardization is, is uh, primarily you know, business-driven, um, but with, in Europe, an added value of having a very close connection to regulation. Mm -hmm. I could go deeper into that if that's of interest. Um, so that's, that's the, the philosophy we have in Germany and Europe. Uh, in the US, there's a bit of a different philosophy where um, it's also business-driven, but also standardization itself is a business. So in the US, they believe the best standard uh, will prevail. Um, and that's a, that's a different attitude, obviously. And um, we've spent a lot of time in past years in trying to explain to each other the different systems. I think now with TTC, we've, you know, we've come a bit... Uh, yes, uh, we've proceeded to, to actually talk about uh, concrete topics. But um, in an ideal world, from a German point of view, we should all meet at, at ISO and IEC, where we do actually meet India, China, and so on. And they do invest a lot there in, in standardization. They, they do participate a lot. Um, but the bad news, that's the good news. The bad mm -hmm. is, news is uh, China is also doing their own standards on top of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Dean has committees in which companies take part, um, and I think BASF and Bosch are both taking part in these committees. And was this one of the reasons why you were laughing when uh, Sevilla said it's complicated? No, actually, um, no, no, I mean, of course it's complicated. I mean, what wouldn't be, um, especially when it comes to standardizing and in, in this multi-layered system, but no, no but I, I think it's great that we speak about standardization because um, that's something that has been a bit out of focus um, for the past years um, and um, because, because it's, uh, it's a long game. And, um, and, and building standards means um, you have to really look at business cases and products um, like five to ten years into the future, because with standards you also open and close markets, and um, which is also part of the charm, but of course also part of the problem, because um, as we understand it, um, the heavy involvement of, of China and India, especially China, um, especially when it comes to electronic standards, um, means that they are in fact, um, well, defining their own standards, their own markets, and if they have the products which prevail on the market, then we're out. And, um, and then well, we have to adapt to their standards, which means that some of the investments, some of the ideas that we have here will probably not be an international standard. So, um, and I think this is now, I think governments have started to understand that. Um, German government, we've spoken to them, and um, well, we, but the industry has spoken to them. And um, I think it's getting there, and we're also getting there in, in, within the company to say that we really need to invest these resources in these standardization bodies, even though there is no immediate return on investment. Um, but um, that it's, yeah, that as we're in it for the long game, um, it's, it's something we need to look at, and we need to look at it in, especially in the transatlantic arena, because of course it's huge joint market. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's something where, um, yeah, where we, yeah, where, where there's, um, yeah, potential to reap, I think, um, w for business and also for um, the transnational friendship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Natalie, do you also want to come in on that point? Yes, <clears throat> I think uh, Christina already mentioned uh, the most important things. Uh, the main question really is uh, the size of the market. And if you look at India or China, um, it's a closed shop. 
in the end. So I think, and that's why it is so interesting if you say um, the best standard prevails, I think another, um, another quality comes in. It's, it's, it's a question of quantity. If, if you have got the biggest market, then you make the standards. Uh, and it's not perhaps the standard which is uh, the best. Um, but technical regulation is part of my uh, governmental affairs team. And I know that, in fact, uh, 10 years from now to the future, they are really discussing with the colleagues from all over the world on those uh, standards. And um, I think we, the, the solution is somewhere in the middle. Um, but the complexity which is behind it is not really known uh, by the public. And I think that's something, and that's, I, I would lead back to your question, how we will be able to um, distribute or to, to have success with uh, success, uh, sustainable products. And I think it's creating awareness. I think at the moment the problem is that um, people feel like um, overwhelmed of complexity and problems and things. And if you don't create a mindset which understands um, parts of the complexity and which changes or helps to change the mindset, you will never be convincing with a product. Because if the product is more expensive and... Um, um, Christoph, Christian, uh, sorry, Hubertus. <laughs> um, um, the, the consumer needs to be um, disposed, able, willing to pay the price for it. But if you don't have the awareness and you don't know why you have to pay the price, I think then we have a problem. So mm. I think sustainability gets along with a lot of information and change of mindset, willingness of the consumer, because without the consumer, you can't build a business case, in my mm. opinion. Mm. Christina, you want yeah, to... I just wanted to add one thing, because I think there's one... <clears throat> when it comes to, for example, CO2 standardization, how do you measure how much carbon is in a product? That's a huge unanswered question. There is no international standards. I mean, we've developed something for us, um, and um, which we're using, which we're driving, but there are other standards out there, and that's also one of the problems that CBAM has. I mean, how much CO2 is in a nail that is imported from India into Europe, and that is what you have to measure, because that's what you want to tax. Mm -hmm. And there is no standard, so, um, so, so, so how, do you, how do you measure scope three? Um, if you talk about CO2 emissions, that's huge. And um, as long as there is no... And, and the second we have such a standard, however it may de um, develop, and I really hope it will be business-driven in a way um, um, that, that it's developed and not um, imposed top-down by governments, because then it will probably not be pragmatic. And I think it will develop. Um, it needs to develop and be dynamic um, in the way it's defined. But, um, but, but, but that is, like, crucial. In or and as soon as we have that standard, I think lots of things will kind of fall into place along the value chain for energy consumption, um, but at the moment um, doesn't exist, and it really creates huge problems. Mm -hmm. I do want to bring in the audience as well, but I, yes, Sibylle so, and Hubertus also wanted to come in. I must say this backfires, the way you're, you're talking. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> please correct me, because I'm not, uh, yeah, please do. It, it, it backfires because our doors are open, so just come yeah. join us, uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm sure BASF, uh, I mean, is yeah. very active in, and as is Bosch. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I know Bosch is, but um, saying uh, as a company, I hope uh, it will be business driven. Is of course, you know, you you have it in your hand uh, to know, come yeah. and and join and and work on the standard. Yeah. And there is plenty of work on carbon uh, footprint for products, uh, but of course it's millions of products, and it's you know different, uh, probably different solutions uh, for different products, but. Um, we're talking here about solutions, and that's mm -hmm. just a general remark I wanted to make because we've been starting a little bit about the challenges in standardization. I think, um, or I want to make it clear that uh, standards are there to reduce complexity. You also talked about complexity. To, to give solutions to... Um, I mean, what's, what are standards for? They, they are... Um, they are 
for comparing test methods, for measurement, for terminology, for um, making, making products comparable and so on. So these are, they're all giving solutions and um, they're best if the companies who use them are actually involved in making them. Mm. Robertus. Yes. I think when it comes to, to the, the sustainability footprint of products, um, we have these diversity of standards. And I don't think that we can solve this problem uh, from the markets or from the, from the companies. It has to be done politically. Because um, you, have, um, you have always um, the chance of a single producer to use a different standard uh, to his own uh, advantage. And as long as uh, this is possible, uh, you won't have one single standard for, for carbon footprint. And when we uh, uh, try to implement things like, like uh, emission trade system, also for, for food chain, what is, I think, the only solution to, to cut down uh, carbon emissions from food systems, uh, then you have an international standard how to measure this footprint. And this uh, has to be based on an international political agreement not mm. on company initiatives. Mm. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there goes my moderation, um, but please, <laughs> Natalie. If, if I may. Yeah. Um, I think I, I fully agree with you, but I think <clears throat> it's a question of homologization uh, or certification because you need to make a reality check with the industry. Mm. It's impossible without the consultancy of the industry to bundle all the interests. And that's what's happening at the moment. I think we're really suffering, especially in the EU, from think tanks that think, <laughs> as the, the name uh, says, without making the reality check that you can implement things. And that's against society that's against the consumer, that's against the industry. And in the end, you need consumers who have the financial strength to pay for the sustainable products. And what's happening at the moment, it's really, it's disruptive because it's risking industry at the moment. And that's why I fully agree that you need like the WTO to give the framework and to say that's now in the end what we want, what we all want, fully agree but don't do it without industrial expertise because you are going to fail without. It's not you <laughs> that is failing, but I think that's really the, the worst problem at the moment that we have two fractions who think that they have the better um, idea on something and you need to debate on it and in the end you have got the result and that probably can work. Yeah, so we need no, no, no. We do need to hear from the thinker on the yeah. from the think tankler thinker. <laughs> think I'm, I'm, tank. I'm, I'm so sorry about being part of the, the the problem in this case, maybe. But um, I wanted to urge, uh, also push back against the idea of accepting a 2.0 degree scenario because that that is still. Uh, um, undetermined. Ten years ago, we were looking at a six-degree scenario, but IPCC projections show that we're, I mean, 2.0, we're still reasonably optimistic, but I think we've done a pretty significant level of deployment for renewables within the past decade, especially with the accomplishments from COP28, the triple up and double down targets. I mean, this is a sectoral target covering power and seeing all of the price breakthroughs in terms of batteries and EVs and all of these things. I really think that it's whether or not we hit 2.0, or I hope we're well below that, but I think that the conversation of seeing that it's acceptable that we're going to exceed past it, I think that's not, I think that that's still undetermined. I think that there's still a lot of room to have a conversation about that. I hope so. But uh, <laughs> yeah, me, me as well. But I think um, going back to the, the conversation of standards, I think the European Union and the North American markets are a huge segment of the global economy, but they're not where most of the growth is happening. Most of the growth is happening within Africa, within Latin America, within Southeast Asia, and South Asia, Central Asia. So how do we get these countries involved? Well, other than China, how do we get these countries to buy into the standards? And I think this is a really, really interesting conversation because the US and EU, if they just enforce standards that are even agreed on the transatlantic level, then how do you make sure you're selling products to other, other, other countries? How do you get them interested in being compliant with your standards? And this is trying to make sure that your standards that you're developing are at least enforceable in jurisdictions or other jurisdictions 
organizations are interested in adopting these standards and making sure that they're meeting them as well. And this is where I think it's a really, really interesting opportunity for the, to go back to the European Union's uh, investigation into anti-subsidy uh, uh, the anti-subsidy investigation into Chinese electric vehicles, is there's a lot of other countries that are really interested in standing up to China on trade, especially around green tech within the EV space. Brazil, for example, uh, recently launched uh, some investigation into Chinese electric vehicles. So I think, and, and there are other countries that are kind of following this path. So I do think there is a lot of opportunity for countries like the United States, Germany, and the EU more broadly to work together and to, to not become protectionist because you know there are provisions of the IRA that do that are, that do kind of veer in this way, but can try and find some way to bring uh, fragments or fractions of the uh, the existing WTO system, the existing trade system, by getting other major emerging markets on the same page by standing up to China. And this isn't to entirely decouple from China, but it's able to to use trade policy and push back a bit rather than just becoming protectionist and isolationist, and also rather than just being run over by Chinese green tech. Because I think it, there is there is a way to find a balance, and it's kind of trying to find a balance between standing up to China but also being willing to to deal with China because. Being too hawkish on this position as well is not exactly ideal either. And I think that, yeah, so, so this is my, my thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we only have time Agreed. for a, a <laughs> couple of questions from the audience. Um, so please come on in, raise your hand. And again, don't be shy. I know that a lot of you are working on sustainability issues. And I know that also a lot of you are interested in standards. They are all tired. Ah, uh, there, there, there they come. First Annika and then Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the EU and sustainability, but also standardization, the EU just passed the AI Act, which kind of pushed forward this whole question of AI and sustainability. But what I'm wondering is, for AI, it's pretty hard to get substantial data, and I'm my question would be how can we push forward standardization regarding AI and sustainability while having not really a lot of data and with companies that kind of not share this data, what would be your way forward? Gosh, Annika, hardball in the, in the <laughs> end. And over to Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, just, yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert in your field. So, uh, with great interest, I understand uh, the, the, the width and the depths of complexity. Going back to Stormy's um, ambition at the very beginning, so how to um, elevate this to a meta, to a type of meta level, so we understand how the solution can look, uh, can look like. I like the notion of, that was made a couple of times, a business case. So, meaning that for small, uh, enterprises, medium enterprises, large caps, it, it all needs to be the same. It needs to be, there needs to be a payback. There needs, it, it needs to come natural as part of a business case, meaning it cannot be preventive or prohibitive from competitiveness to act according to those rules. How do we get there? Thank you, because that was also my last ending question. <laughs> so with this, um, I hand it back to our panelists, and um, Hubertus, maybe you can start us yes. off. Yes, it's, it's a really good question. I, I'm, I have no clue about AI, so I, <laughs> I mm -hmm. start with this question. We, um, we had a commission in, in Germany about the future of agriculture, and uh, uh, the outcome of this commission was a, was a report, and one of the main, main outcomes of this report was that the um, the sustainability transition of food systems only can happen when everything to do to achieve this transition has to be economically attractive for every farmer, for every person in the food chain and also for the consumer. And you ask how can we achieve this? Uh, our story is that we say we need public money to make this true, to, to make this a business case but the amount of public money we need to create these business cases is much lower than the amount we have to pay when we do nothing and stay in the way we uh, are used to and risk climate change uh, above 2.0 or 3 degrees and, and have all this pollution we have today. And so, okay, it's, it's not a really uh, smart story, but it works with public money 
but it's cheaper than doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sibylle. Uh, I, I think I'd, I'm trying to address your, <laughs> your question. Um, the connection between AI, circular economy, and standardization, I mean, you've been asking about data. I'm not quite sure how, um, um, if my answer will satisfy you, but the, um, the way we, in, at Dean at least, we um, start in a new technology field or a new field like circular economy, we um, invite stakeholders. And in both fields, we have actually um, were very successful in, in, in uh, inviting hundreds of stakeholders that came to us and worked with us on what we call standardization roadmap. So that means for both AI and circular economy and smart farming, in fact, and also currently hydrogen, um, we look uh, with stakeholders at um, what is already there in standards that help um, for proceeding that technology um, and what is still missing. So we find the necessities uh, for people then to, to work on standards. And um, this is, you know, this this can be found on our homepage, and it's it's probably quite interesting reading to see, you know, what what is there already and what can be worked with and where um, extra work or where the the work is going to. Um, and with AI, we, we I think we talked with about that um, yesterday also. The um, that the AI Act is now uh, ahead, and this is one example of of many examples in the EU where there's a pretty neat um, division of labor between the regulator um, and private standardization. So the regulator sets the requirements, the central requirements, the level of protection, what have you, and then tells us, the private standardization organizations, to, together with our stakeholders, the experts obviously, to make standards that give the solutions. And we are starting work on AI and have already started obviously on circular economy. Thank you so much, Christina. <coughs> Christina. Okay, um, I think the way to the business case is first of all to be, for, for the regulators to be less prescriptive. Because I think business will find a way, if you set us goals, um, if you tell us we need to be carbon neutral by, and I mean, 2040, 2050, um, business will find a way because we are innovative, we have, ca we, we have cash, um, we will innovate, um, but what we need is tech openness, and we don't have technological openness, at least not in Europe, um, which is why um, I personally think that the IRA um, is going the right way because it is, it, it sets goals, it gives... It, it, it subsidizes operating expenditures, so actually the business case, um, whereas um, the EU um, subsidizes iron in the ground, um, it, it subsidizes certain technologies, it prescribes which, which, which technologies um, can be subsidized, and then we, then, then, then we build electrolyzers in, in Nutrixhafen for, with lots of public money, and so we try out the technology here, but in the end, this will not produce a single ton of hydrogen, which is competitive, due to the energy prices that we have currently in Europe. And that's crazy. So, I mean, let, 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 us, let, let's t let us take the risk for the technology, let us do the bets um, on what will finally drive sustainability, and, and then kind of open us, have market pool measures in a way that we can, uh, that incentivize the products. So um, tax incentives or operating expenditures, um, um, maybe also innovation grants for, for, some, for something. But again, technologically as open as possible, because I don't know that regulators have the right way. EVs, yes, are probably the right way. Are they really? I don't know. Um, so, um, and, but, but we will never know, because at least um, in Europe, um, we said that's the only way. And um, we're not in the EV business in that way, but it's just one of the. It's, 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 now I know, but it's just one of the, the one of the crazy things um, where we say, well, that's the way. Do they know? I don't know. So um, openness, um, pull measures, ah, and then I forgot infrastructure. If they want to put money in somewhere, then in infrastructure, because that is where it's roads, it's glass fiber, and it's electricity networks. That's where public money needs to go because if we have world-class infrastructure, investments will come. That's what pulled us here out of the uh, after the war. 
That's what pulled South Korea um, and um, had, their, had their growth drive. And that's where we're losing out at the moment. And the second we have world-class infrastructure again, that's the rivers of the past, that's the, the, the Roman, what, what was it, Via, via Appia, um, and um, that, that's actually what pulls trade. Thank so, um, so much. that would be my way to more sustainable business case. Thank you so much, Natalie, your sustainable case. I think it's up to case. me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I dare um, to answer the question on the AI Act. And um, I think you alluded to the Chinese project, the screening projects, uh, where uh, we see a large competi competition on... Um, screening lots of data without the permission of the data owner. And I think the AI Act doesn't say that you can't use um, data, um, but it gives standards, but not technical standards, but perhaps somehow um, either technical standards to and I think that's the key word to make transparent what's going to happen with the data. And um, I think that's a key question as well, to give the faith to the users to contribute or to, be, to deliver their data in order to make them accessible for use of AI. I think that's something which is very important in Europe because I think it's a question or a matter of trust and it's a question as well, perhaps it's a label or it's a way of making transparent that for some products uh, AI is used. Um, and I have got one anecdote on it because uh, I went to a conference where uh, we had a soft drink and it was labeled with, uh, made with AI. It was disgusting, by the way, but I think this has nothing <laughs> to do with the AI which was used for it. But I think that's important for the user and that's why we have this kind of legislation in Europe. Because I think we, we depart from another, um, from another side and we don't take data without asking the data owner. I think we try to build trust to make the owner giving us uh, its data. At least that's how mm. our company deals with it because if you imagine mm. automotive driving without, without uh, tons of data which can be um, processed with AI as well, I think we have to make it transparent, but if we wouldn't use those data, we wouldn't be able to have uh, real-time automated driving. So I think it gets together if you want to be a competitive industry. Thank you so much. And last but not least, you've been waiting very patiently. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you for the floor. I really wanted to build off the, the comment to invest in infrastructure, but I, you forgot to mention ports. Import, ports are important. Uh, sorry yeah, for that's that. True. But uh, <laughs> especially in the case of offshore wind, I mean, European <laughs> offshore wind companies are world leaders in many, many regards, but because they hadn't been supported uh, as needed, they're not as competitive as they once were globally. I mean, they're, they're losing out to China and African markets and the Gulf markets in uh, Southeast Asia and potentially in Latin America on the horizon. So I do think there has to be a degree of strategic support for industries that, that do offer a lot. And it, it's about finding the balance and what that support mechanism looks like. I think finding a support mechanism that is, is as least onerous as possible, but without being uh, too wasteful with public funding as well, because you do want to encourage that that fiscal discipline and, and to, to spur competition, but you also want to be fair competition. And this is where I think that I, I go back to the example with, with, uh, with Chinese EVs in the case of Brazil and other countries coming along, is how do you get countries to observe the standards that you really want to enforce? How do you get them to g get buy-in? And I think it's about showing uh, uh, other markets that, that there is, um, there is ground to be gained by, you know, by standing up to China, not to, I mean, referring to China a lot here, but I think that there, this is, uh, there, is, there is plenty for them to gain from gaining value. And this is uh, something you can see within the, the German climate foreign policy strategy, the German national security strategy, and other strategic documents that talk about creating um, 
fair partnerships that are just and et cetera, or even you can even see it within uh, US partnerships that are, are coming across uh, in different countries within Africa about kind of creating value within these countries as well and trying to have different, different kinds of relationships than they had previously had. And I think this is one way to get other countries to be a little more on board with, uh, with standards so that they, they can get some value of it rather than just being an extractive zone. But this goes into a much more complicated space than just transatlanticism. But within the transatlantic space, I do think there can be some kind of I mean, the JHPS, so the Just Energy Transition Partnership, are, it's, they're not as being as successful as they could have been, but this is one example where you can have government partnership across the Atlantic to try and create a new partnership or a new, new alternative development model for, for other countries, but this goes beyond, slightly beyond the scope of trade. But I, I, think, it, I think it's important to try to find a buy-in to make other governments and outside of China, the Europe, and the United States to have buy-in to, to support the existing systems that uh, honor kind of tr uh, standards and rules that are set within the international system that exists. Mm. Thank you so much. There are so many other issues we uh, could, could have talked about. It turned a little bit into a standard setting uh, panel. <laughs> Sibylle, what did you do? <laughs> but it is such an important aspect, um, both nationally, transatlantically and internationally. Um, there are other aspects we, we could have and should have probably brought in. We are going to do that next time talking about also education and the labor market and these aspects. I know that it's really important for the um, agriculture sector, but certainly also for production. Um, and uh, we keep that for another time, because while all other panels were very disciplined and all other moderators were very good in keeping time, I wasn't, and I already <laughs> kept you too long up here. So thank you very, very much. For all of you, don't run out yet, because there's a closing section, and for that I want all of you in here. But first of all, give our panelists a big applause for being here and for sharing so many insights. <laughs>